Hello again, everyone. You can see I'm now wearing a hat. I got it on Rock Island where we were spending the last few days camping out the Feast of Sukkot and the last great day. To say the least, it rained a good part of the time, but we survived it in this untoward climate. Now I'm back. The purpose, this might take several parts, but I'm going to discuss the resurrection day of Messiah Yeshua. We're going to answer the question, when it happened, according to the scriptures, and we're going to bring in the Torah passages. I'm going to give you a kind of an outline of where we're going now, because it'll probably take more than one part to finish this. First, we're going to start with a simple, simple explanation with the facts of when the resurrection happened. And then we're going to move on to a prediction that the majority would corrupt the faith and go wrong, which is in the scripture. And then we will deal with the Greek texts and counter arguments that might be made to when the resurrection day happened. And finally, we'll go over the overall context and shows how the overall context fits the conclusion. If you look below, you will see a outline in the notes below the video. I will also be posting the outline and words on the screen as we go so you can see it. So if you want to jump to any particular topic, you'll be able to do so. The time index will be associated with the points in the outline below. I will be using all of my books in this talk, particularly The Good News of Messiah. There's The Good News of Messiah. We'll be quoting from it right there. The translation of the New Testament. This is the fifth edition and it currently runs more than 500 pages. Resurrection Day of Messiah Yeshua, which I finished a couple years ago. Around 480 pages. If you include the index of scripture dates and subjects. This is a very scholarly, in-depth, involved in the original languages text. And of course, I've already made some videos about this book. The Scroll of Biblical Chronology, Volume 1. And finally, we now have the Scroll of Biblical Chronology, Volume 2. And this is the proof volume we are looking at. I'm expecting the first shipment to come in the mail within a week or so. It's not posted on the website either. And for that matter, I haven't posted the fifth edition of the Good News of Messiah on the website. Nevertheless, if you order one, that's what you'll be getting. You'll be getting the fifth edition if you order directly from me. What I want to start with now is the good news of Messiah, and particularly the passage Mark 16, verses 1 and 2a. I will go through the text with you and show you when the resurrection day was. All right, here's Mark 16, 1 and the good news of Messiah. And what I'm going to show is I'm going to show that the resurrection day of Messiah Yeshua was on the seventh day Sabbath before dawn, during the latter end of the night, which we would call Friday night. All right. And when the Sabbath was passed, Miriam ha Magdalene, and Miriam the mother of Yaakov, and shallow meat, bought spices. The Sabbath being referred to here is the annual Sabbath, which fell between Wednesday and Thursday sunset in the year of the crucifixion. After this Sabbath was over, they went out and bought spices. They went after the Sabbath because when the Sabbath was passed, because you can't buy or sell on the seventh day. That wasn't allowed according to the law. If you look in the book of Nehemiah chapter 10, you will actually see 
an application of the prohibition against buying and selling. So after an annual Sabbath, midweek, Wednesday sunset to Thursday sunset, they bought the spices. So actually, they bought the spices on the sixth day of the week, which was Friday. Okay, so now let's go over to the next verse. They bought spices that having come, they might anoint him. Now the spices that they bought were aromatic spices, sweet spices, like putting air freshener on the body and in the atmosphere. This was not an embalming operation. And very early on the first of the Sabbath, they are coming upon the tomb. Okay. So after Friday, when the weekly Sabbath came along, which is also called the first of the Sabbaths, we will explain what first means, but this is some Sabbath that's called first. Very early, Leon Proe in Greek refers to the earliest dawn, very, very early in the morning, not near, not near sunrise, but very, very early, they came to the tomb. So we can infer from this that the resurrection was at some point during the night before the Sabbath day dawned, also called the first of the Sabbaths. Okay, now they couldn't buy or sell anything on the first of the Sabbaths or the Sabbath. That is from Friday sunset to Sabbath sunset. So of course, the spices that they bought after the annual Sabbath we just read about in verse 1 would have had to be bought on a day between the two Sabbaths. So we have in the chronology is we have a Sabbath and then a day on which ordinary work can be done and then we have another Sabbath following that. So we have a Sabbath, an ordinary day, a Sabbath. And they bought the spices between the two, two Sabbaths. So this situation can only occur when you have an annual Sabbath followed at some point by a weekly Sabbath. And this is what happened during Passion Week or during the week of Yeshua's suffering. There was an annual Sabbath in verse 16 recorded here and there was a weekly Sabbath following that. So we can see that necessarily the resurrection was before the point that they went to the tomb, which was very early on the first of the Sabbaths. Okay, at this point I want to address the question of why there was a first Sabbath after an annual Sabbath. We're going to explain why it was called the first of the Sabbaths. And to do that, we're going to go over to Leviticus 23.11 through verses 15 and 16, and we're going to explain where the first Sabbath comes from, where the first of the Sabbaths comes from. Okay, for this I'm going to use the King James Version is tolerably well translated. We'll start in Leviticus 23, verse 11 here. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, Yahweh, to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Here's the important verse. And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheep of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number fifty days, and ye shall offer a new meat offering unto Yahweh. Okay, where it says, And ye shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath. This Sabbath in verse 15 is the same Sabbath mentioned over here back in verse 11, right here. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. According to the rabbis and the best scholars, and I, I will discuss this further, this Sabbath here is the annual Sabbath, the 15th of Aviv, the 15th of Nisan. It's the annual Sabbath. 
Passover Sabbath it falls every year in the spring. It's after this Sabbath that the seven Sabbaths are counted, down here in verse 15. Seven Sabbaths shall be complete. Now, in order to count, it says, and you shall count. Okay, so counting requires an enumeration, according to this commandment, unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought in the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So this means counting a first Sabbath, a second Sabbath, a third Sabbath, and so on, until you get to a seventh Sabbath. And indeed, in verse 16, we see here that there is a seventh Sabbath. So what this implies is that following the annual Sabbath, as we see in verse 15, 11 here, the Sabbath, annual Sabbath, and also counting after this annual Sabbath, we see that there are seven Sabbaths that are counted. So this is the origin of the phrase or the idiom, first of the Sabbaths, which we read in Mark 16, and which we will see are in the other four Gospels for evangelists. The reason I'm using the King James here is so you can see that even using a translation which isn't perfect. This isn't perfect. There's problems here. There's problems in the translation. I just haven't discussed them with you yet. But we can see that seven Sabbaths are actually counted according to the literal Hebrew. What we just went over was the origin of the phrase first of the Sabbaths. We can see that from the counting commanded in Leviticus 23.15 that there has to be a first Sabbath or first of the Sabbaths, following the first day of unleavened bread. We also read in Leviticus 23:11 about how the wave offering was waved in the tomorrow of the Sabbath, and the Sabbath was the annual Sabbath. Now we want to go a little bit further into identifying this annual Sabbath. If we look in the book of Yohanan, we will see the Sabbath clearly identified by the evangelist. So let's take a look at that passage in the Good News of Messiah. Okay, now we have the Good News of Messiah open to the book of Yohanan, and in chapter 31, I mean chapter 19, and in verse 31. So here we are. The Yehudim, therefore, because it was the day of preparation, so that the bodies will not have remained on the execution timber on the Sabbath, because that Sabbath was great, had asked Pilate that their legs may be broken, and that they may be taken away. So this is the Sabbath after the crucifixion on the execution timber, which is my phrase for the cross. That Sabbath is called great because that Sabbath was great. And what Yohanan is saying here is that the great Sabbath was a feast day or the annual Sabbath that year. All right, in Yohanan 1931, we have an annual Sabbath, a feast day, which fell midweek that year. I will also remind you that we read in Mark 16:1 that they bought the spices after the Sabbath. The Sabbath after which they bought the spices was the same annual Sabbath that is spoken about in the book of Yohanan, being called the Great Sabbath. Also, the rabbis agree with this opinion. Generally, all of them hold that Leviticus 23.11 and 23.15 refer to the annual Sabbath, the first day of unleavened bread. And the translators of the Septuagint version also agree with this opinion because in Leviticus 23.11 and 23.15 they substitute the words the first day standing for the first day of unleavened bread as their explanation of this annual Sabbath. I would like to do a separate video on Leviticus 23.11 through 16, and particularly concentrating on the implications of verse 16 and why the Karaite interpretation of this verse is incorrect. 
So at this time, I'm not going to go into this matter. What I want to establish is that seven Sabbaths were counted after the Passover, after the first day of unleavened bread. Now, we have looked at the Mark 16, 1 and 2 passage. I want to look at the other three evangelists, Matthew and, Yo and Yohanan and um, also Luke. First, we'll look at Matthew 28, 1, and then we'll look at Luke 24, and then we'll look at Yohanan 20. All right, we're now here looking at Matthew 28, 1, the good news of Messiah. But the later of the Sabbaths, at the dawning on the first of the Sabbaths, Miriam ha Magdalene and the other Miriam came to look at the grave. But the later of the Sabbaths, remember how I've explained that there was an annual Sabbath in Passover week, the first day of unleavened bread, referred to in Leviticus 23.11 and verse 15, and then the weekly Sabbath following it is the first of the Sabbaths. So Matthew is explaining that this weekly Sabbath is the later of the Sabbaths, that is the later one of two Sabbaths, at the dawning on the first of the Sabbaths. So again, this is the first of the seven Sabbaths that the commandment tells us to count. The two women, Miriam ha Magdalene, or Mary Magdalene, and the other Miriam came to look at the grave. So also the evangelist Matiyahu describes the resurrection just before dawn on the first of the Sabbaths. Okay, we're now in the book of Luke, chapter 24. As you see here, I have verse 54b. That's from chapter 23, because I've actually rearranged chapter and verse divisions here, as required by the chronology. And having followed him throughout his ministry, the women, who had been coming with him out of Galilee, saw the tomb and how his body was laid. And having returned, they prepared the spices and perfumes. And on the one Sabbath they rested, but on the first of the Sabbaths, in deep dawn, they came upon the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So we have the two Sabbaths mentioned here. We have the annual Sabbath on which they rested, and then we have the following first of the Sabbaths when they came to the tomb, according to Leviticus 23, 15. This in Greek is what is called a men day passage, which in Greek syntax is used to compare and contrast. So he's saying on the one hand, they rested on the annual Sabbaths, but on the first of the Sabbaths, because it was the end of the third day, they came at deep dawn, they came upon the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. So Luke also is telling us that the resurrection of Messiah was on the first Sabbath after the Passover Sabbath, or after the annual Sabbath. Okay, now we're in the book of Yohanan, which is the same as the John the Evangelist in chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first of the seven, now on the first of the Sabbath, Miriam ha Magdalene is herself coming early, darkness still being, to the tomb, when she sees the stone having been getting removed from the tomb. So again, we see that Yohanan has mentioned the first of the Sabbaths as the resurrection day, and the annual Sabbath, which was alluded to in Matthew, and mentioned in Mark, is back in, in the book of Yohanan, is, was mentioned back in um, chapter 19 and in verse 31. So in reality, all four Gospels are referring to both Sabbaths or, re, or alluding to them or implying the existence of two Sabbaths in the, in the Passion Week. Okay, there is one more occurrence which we should quickly cover here. Okay. Therefore, it being later on that day, the first of the Sabbaths, 
and when the doors had been kept shut, where the disciples were staying, for fear of the Yehudim, Yeshua came and stood in their midst. Okay, so on the same resurrection day after Yeshua had risen from the dead, had risen from the dead, it was still the first Sabbath after Passover, and they were meeting in the upper room. Yeshua came and stood in their midst. And of course, in the book of Acts, we have a reference to the first of the Sabbaths, in chapter 20, verse 7. And on the first of the Sabbaths, when we had been getting gathered together to break bread. The whole chronology of this passage is dependent upon translating the rest of the passage correctly. So I will cover this in another video. And we have our final passage where the first of the Sabbaths is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 2. Down through the first the Sabbaths, let each one of you be putting aside, saving, whatever he may be prospering. So it's not saying on the first of the Sabbaths that they should put it aside, but down through. So he's talking about this period of the year. This is explained in the footnotes on the previous page here, and I'm not going to go into this at this time. But down through is a very literal translation of kata, of the preposition kata used here. Okay, so I've covered all the passages in the Good News of Messiah, in the Evangelists and in Acts, and in Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, where the first of the Sabbaths is mentioned. I've left out the longer ending of Mark because it doesn't really belong in the scripture, as the better scholars will point out. The reason that passage is put in the Bibles is because it, the printers do not want to go against the traditional expectation of the majority of Christendom. But the passage doesn't belong in, and the reasons why is an explanation for another time. If you want to find out quickly what I think, you can get a good news of Messiah. I have a whole appendix explaining why. Okay, I've read you all the first of the Sabbath's passages. Now I want to inquire as to why they are all translate, mistranslated first day of the week by mainstream Christianity. To begin, let's go look at the book of Matthew, chapter 7, and verses 21 to 23. Rather, I will read you that passage from the Good News of Messiah. Not everyone who says to me, Adonai, Adonai, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to thee, many will say to me on that day, Adonai, Adonai, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will confess to them, I never acknowledged you, be departing from me you who practice lawlessness. So we see here that it is the many who are going to be practicing lawless. And the many obviously describes the majority, the majority who have fallen away from the original messianic faith. Okay, that concludes this episode of the Resurrection Day of Messiah Yeshua. In the next episode, I want to discuss the first day of the week and the problems with the first day of the week translation. I also want to discuss how the majority of Christians ended up being so wrong about history's most important event. Thanks for listening.